So today's presentation is basically what I would give an architectural group. So it's a, an AIA certified presentation for LU and HSW credits. So um, any questions that come up during the presentation, feel free, you know, we'll talk about it. Um, it's very open, I wanna have open dialogue. So quick course description. Uh, the program will describe the qualities of natural landscape stone and best practices associated with the coring, fabrication, and installation in support of sustainable design. Participants will acquire insights about the natural stones industry, industry's advocacy for social, economic, and environmental responsibility while providing this valued landscape material for architectural use. And there's four learning objectives to the program. Uh, the first is to distinguish the environmental responsible, environmentally responsible and the sustainable qualities of natural landscape stone in align, as they align with green building philosophies and lead construction objectives. And how that typically works is if the material is within a 500 mile sphere of the project site, you can qualify for those lead construction points. So with our Fond du Lac Chilton quarries, we're well within that range. Um, we have other materials though that would not qualify. So, um, number two is to identify the most effective methods for quarrying pro the quarrying processes in support of regulatory standards and ethics, while optimizing resource management, waste reduction, environmental preservation, and overall economic growth. The third is to recognize best practices in cutting, extracting, and fabricating natural stone, and highlight the importance of investing in quality equipment advocating employee safety and promoting the strategic use and reuse of limestone infused water while preparing natural stone for architectural landscape utilization and I'll point that out as we get to those slides why we have to use water in the production process and then to determine the and define installation patterns and strategies proven to enhance the aesthetics of retaining walls and patio projects outdoor living uh, that will withstand the test of time. So, natural stone is as varied as your imagination. Uh, it's formed in the earth, it is what it is. It creates unique diversity and limitless design potential. If you guys can think of projects um, using natural stone that are still standing, does anything come to mind? Tower. What's that? Full shade tower. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anything else? Think it through the ages. Pyramids. There you go. Bingo. Yes. Yes. So the pyramids are always number one. Stonehenge is always like two or three. And some other big structures that are still standing. What's that? Colosseum. Yeah. Roman Colosseum, the aqueducts. If you go through Europe and you see all the castles, cathedrals that are still, you know, still standing using natural stone. Uh, you go out in the, into China, you see the Great Wall of China still standing. Um, so, if it's done right, it's going to last a very, very long time. So natural stone is also durable. It's a durability not found in other building materials. It has proven to endure the history and legacy of mankind through the ages. It has stood the test of time. So if you take natural stone and you, you know, take that cost that you purchase the product with and divide it out by the number of years that that structure will remain, you get a tremendous value. You know, it takes millions of years to form some of this material. It's not going to go away. You know, it's going to withstand that test of time if you use the right materials, and I'll kind of get into that too. Natural stone is also readily available and has green attributes for lead intended construction. It's environmentally responsible. Uh, it is a low embodied energy product with limited maintenance requirements and no off gassing which means that we're not using paints or pigments or kilns or anything like that to produce this material. It's all harvested out of the earth uh, naturally. So the carbon footprint is actually lower using uh, our coring process than a man-made product. And natural stone is also recyclable as a low to no waste resource. When we quarry material, anything that's not used for building stone, landscape stone, or cut stone is then crushed. So 99.9% .9 of everything that we quarry is utilized. Uh, the only time we're losing material is in the sawing process, that little slurry that runs through the saw. So 
you know, we produce a lot of gravel. <laughs> and natural stone is also valued as a high quality product. It's recognized in the industry as a high grade pro product. It involves longevity with the exceptional ease of maintenance that far exceeds, oh, did I? Okay, yeah. It's also very regulated. I'm sorry, I clicked back one. But we're also regulated by four governing bodies. So you have MSHA, which is the Mine and Safety Health Administration, OSHA, the EPA, and the DNR that are constantly is evaluating how we quarry our material, making sure that we're not uh, doing something illegal. Um, New York and Wisconsin are the highest regulated states in the union. Uh, we now have quarries down in North Carolina that we operate out of as well. And it's kind of funny because we see our MSHA rep in Wisconsin oh, almost on a, a monthly, bi-monthly basis. And we see the guy in North Carolina on maybe a yearly, maybe you know, twice a year visit. <laughs> so a little bit different in how they regulate things uh, from area to area. But what they look at is the employee safety, environmental impact studies, and then quarry reclamation plans. Does anyone know what a reclamation plan is? <coughs> I know you do. <laughs> anyone else? So before we even have a chance to open a quarry, we have to, uh, there's, a lot, there's a long process of <coughs> finding the stones. So we actually have to hire a, a geologist who will go around and then source where that material will be. And then he will take core samples. So they will drill into the ground uh, to give us an idea of where the stone is, how deep that quarry might be, you know, if it's 40, 50, 60 you know, feet deep. Uh, the span, the, the length and the depth of the material of the quarry, just to give us an idea of how many years we'd be able to quarry in that particular area. This is a sample that's just south of Fond du Lac. So what we look at is the quality of the stone, the color of the stone. Um, is it going to fit uh, with what we currently have? Is it a nice, you know, a good color to work with long term? So I'll hand this around. This is a core sample from just south of Fond du Lac. But the reclamation plan then goes into place um, where if we open a new quarry, we cannot just harvest all the material out and leave a hole in the ground. So we have to fill that back in. So what they do is they take all of the overburden, uh, the hard top, they make a berm, but then that's pushed back into the quarry after the quarry is exhausted. Typically we turn it back into a farm field. So um, some places will actually turn it into a, a swimming hole. Um, I don't know if you guys have any swimming holes in this area with uh, old quarries. There's a couple in our area. But yeah, the reclamation plan is basically saying you have to have um, a plan in place to take care of that land once it's done so wildlife can come back into that area after it's exhausted. Howdy, how's it going? Are these all open? Yep, absolutely. So some of the different quarry types that we work with, uh, block quarries. So block quarries are a huge deposit of natural stone. So you can see this is a typical block quarry. How big and scope these are. You see this little crane here. How massive these quarries can get. Um, but it's a very large deposit of natural stone. So it's, it's all one major deposit. If you guys are familiar with Indiana limestone, a little bit. That is a typical block quarry. So how do they extract that material? Uh, there's three different methods that they will use to extract the material. The first is to saw the material out. There's a huge chainsaw type contraption. They'll actually rip through the block or rip through the stone. As you see here, very consistent lines. There's a mechanical arm or machine that will come here and then pull this down, break these up uh, to shippable size pieces. Because these get very long in length as they rip through that stone. Um, the second is blasting. So they will drill down five to eight feet. I don't know if you can see the, the core drills, the core hole there. But they will drill down five to eight feet, place their explosive, set off that charge, and then loosen that, that block from that entire vein. And then the third is to use Dexpan. It's an expandable product. You pour it into those holes that are drilled down five to eight feet. It slowly expands and then pops that block off of that vein. 
So we use this, the blasting process, for our quarries in Wisconsin probably 99% of the time because it's the quickest. Um, if there's a residential area and the wind's blowing the wrong way and, and we have to stay quiet, we'll use that from time to time. But uh, more often than not, we're just blasting the material out. So once that block is then loosened from that, from that vein, they segregate it by color and size. From that point, they can then ship it out. So these blocks, there's two blocks on a truck. A truck can carry 48,000 pounds. So these two blocks are approximately 12 ton a piece. They're pretty big. You know, these can get up to 10, 12 feet in length sometimes, uh, five to eight feet in depth, and then five to eight feet in height. So some very large, large blocks. From this point, once it gets into the quarrying process or the, the manufacturing process, this is where you see the water running through those saws. And they're ripping those, those blocks down to create slabs, sills, you name it. But this water is extremely important because it does three things. It keeps that blade cool as it's ripping through that stone. It also uh, cleans the stone as it's running through it. But the most important part is there's, you know, you see these guys back here? Um, years ago, this was not implemented as a regulation, but years ago, it was just dry and it was kicking out stone dust. So all that dust was in that air. Those guys in that area working were breathing that in. So uh, that keeps the dust down as it's ripping through the block. So here's your, you know, it sills with a little drip edge, uh, the bread sliced slabs there, slabs stacked. Um, typical block cord product is much more pliable. So for panels, for railings, balusters, that's all natural stone. So um, very pliable material and it can be utilized in many different fashions. Typically sills, caps, hearths, mantles, you name it. Um, that is typical for block quarry stone. Now for outdoor living, you have <laughs> countertop slabs, uh, pool copings. But one of the things that we want to make sure on it, does anyone work with pools like this? In that kind of application? One of the things that we're going to ask you, if you're going to use natural stone along this edge, we're going to ask, is it a salt water pool or is it a saline pool? Because if it is a salt water pool, that will eat away at this stone very quickly. If you guys have been to a hotel in the recent years and have seen that, <laughs> yeah, they have to be very careful. So if you're gonna use natural stone near a pool like this, we'll make certain recommendations on product that will handle that better. Is there a sealer you can put on it? Yes, there is. There are sealers that you can use too. Does anyone have that information from SRW? I know you guys carry SRW as a sealer. So, um, they do have sealers that can be utilized as well. And we would highly recommend it actually. Uh, probably damp proofing the entire stone to keep it. So, so yeah, we have done steps like this with block quarry stone. So just kind of showing you some of the different colors. Uh, it's hard to see all the numbers and everything else here, but uh, certain products that are block quarries, again, they're more porous. <laughs> They're typically more porous. They're easier to man manipulate. So we can create some pretty interesting you know, features, but it's not always the best application in the Midwest to use a block quarry stone. So products like Indiana or um, softer materials like that are typically not going to be recommended for landscape applications. If they are, there's a lot of things that we're going to talk about. <laughs> so like damp proofing, sealing, making sure it's reapplied year after year after year to make sure you keep that uh, visual strong. There are other block quarry products though that are more dense. So this is a product that is a little denser. It's a little harder, more uh, durable material. Uh, but what we look for is the absorption rate of the stone. So um, that's critical for landscape applications. So if you're using steps like this, uh, what we're going to look at is the density and then the absorption rate. How, how is it going to handle the Midwest and the freeze-thaw cycles, everything else that's going through that, that area? 
Uh, we want to make sure that it's going to handle that uh, wear and tear over the years. So we look for product that's typically under 1% absorption rate for those kind of applications. So if it's over, we're going to recommend sealing or try to push something else on that. So the next type of quarry is a pit quarry. Pit quarries are typically granites, you know, granite cobbles, granite boulders, um, much more dense, hard material. So they are sorted and stacked by size. So you get like, you know, baseball size, basketball size, beach ball size, and then huge granite boulders like this. A lot of color, uh, very, very common for this area. But with your typical granite product, you have an absorption rate at 0.15%. So it's an extremely dense product, which is perfect for that kind of application in the Midwest. Plus the density of the material is over 20,000 PSI. So it's a very heavy, very dense, but very low porosity. So that's extremely valuable for a landscape project. And then what we deal with typically in our area, the ledge bed quarry. So this is a sedimentary quarry. So formed in layers, as you can see, there are many layers running uh, horizontally and vertically throughout the quarry. So um, what we look for when we start blasting and getting this material extracted, uh, the top of this is the bed face, so the bed of the quarry. And what we'll look at is the seam that's running along this edge, how much um, how tight is that seam? How loose is that seam? The looser the seam, the more, the more striation you get here. The tighter the seam, the more color that will come out of that area. So if we're trying to do a, a weathered edge, uh, Fond du Lac or Chilton material, uh, and we want vibrant colors, we'll typically look for a tight seam in the quarry to blast and utilize that material. And we blast probably every two to three weeks. Once they do blast, uh, they will then extract that material with their skid loaders by ramming a seam and then popping that material out. So, Phil, when you blast, <coughs> you're just trying to break it off the other part. Correct. So then when you go into your front end loader with forks, you're doing it that way because if you do too big a blast, it creates too many... Too many fractures. Material Correct. Yep. So that's, a, that's an exact science. Um, we hire out all of our companies to do the blasting. We don't do it in-house anymore. Um, but yeah, that's an exact science because if you use too much dynamite, yeah, you're going to fracture the material. So um, yeah, you just want it loosened. Have they ever tried that pressure where they drill it and pour stuff in and expand? Yes. Yeah, we've done that in the past too. More frequently blasting, but we have done uh, the dex pan as well. Yep. So the layers in the quarry vary. So uh, as you can see here, there's a very, very high layer, a tall layer of material. Uh, typically in the ledge bed quarries, the sedimentary quarries, uh, we're not going to see over 9, 10 inches in height for that layer. So that's, uh, that's the max that we typically get out of those, those quarries. Right below it, though, you see like an inch, inch tall layer and how that changes. So those smaller layers are typically culled out for steppers and flagstone, where the taller layers are typically utilized for building stone. So the goal, though, is to get as big a piece of pot as possible. So here's a picture of some of our, our Fond du Lac boulders, and these will range in bigger. As we get deeper into the quarries, uh, you have deeper veins where you get uh, layers where you can pull out huge blocks like this. So the Fond du Lac boulders will typically, they're a little more irregular. You know, they're not all consistent, like, you know, perfect uh, benches. But um, they will range typically from like 36 to 60 inch in length. Um, I, and I've seen them up to almost, you know, four feet in height. So anything usually 18 to 48 in height. Uh, and then in depth, they go anywhere from, 
I'd say 12 inch to you know 36 inch in depth. So there's a lot of weight to those pieces. So here's a ledge bed quarry picture of uh, rustic weathered edge built-in material. So yeah, this is where the mineral deposit was formed on the face. All the inside of the material is gray, but very colorful, very vibrant. What's the absorption rate on this stuff? Sure, glad you asked. <laughs> so yeah, um, on our website we have all those resources too. But Chilton, Chilton stone or Fond du Lac stone is very, very low, low absorption rate, which is perfect for landscape applications. Um, Fond du Lac stone is 0.36% absorption rate. Chilton is 0.08, so almost no absorption rate whatsoever. Plus the densities of this material, Fond du Lac is over 36,000 PSI. Chilton is around 50,000 PSI, so higher than granite. So extremely high, dense material. Uh, makes it excellent for landscape stone applications, excellent for building stone applications, but it is a terrible cut stone. <laughs> it does not handle the saw. So very, very challenging to use because of that. Seems odd that it's a higher rate than granite, but it busts like droppers. Well, I have a piece of uh, Fond du Lac here that we do for, actually let me see here, I think I have, I have a chilton here too. I was going to pass this around, but just to show you, like uh, for chilton stone, we get a lot of color. You know, you guys are familiar with chilton flagstone. There's typically a lot of color in that material, how it changes from layer to layer. Um, I, I went through our palettes, I just picked this out because I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Um, the bed face will change from the small layer, there's a layer here that's maybe, oh, a quarter of an inch in thickness, but this layer here is gray, the layer right below it is red. And this is all what settled in that area millions of years ago, creating those color tones. So, yeah, it's amazing how that can change from just those little layers. Um, then you look at the backside and it's a different color. So. Um, so I can hand this around to show you. So getting into the production side, when they, once they start um, bringing those large, you know, pallet-shaped pieces into production, they will snap those to make landscape stone, wall stone, retaining wall stone, um, making sure that they're nice and crisp. We'll measure them to make sure they're the spec. And they have the spec sheets over here. So granite is like more brittle than that fun lacquer. Did you say that? Or? I don't know if I'd say that. Yeah, yeah, because granite's pretty u universally used in landscape. So, um, so that that sample that I'm handing around, who's got the sample? Okay. <laughs> so the top and the bottom of those pieces. So the top and bottom is the bed face. That's what we're utilizing for, like our the top of the Chilton flag or stepper. Um, where all that color was settled. The front edge is the weathered edge. So if you guys are familiar with like weathered edge wall stone, um, weathered edge outcroppings, that's that mineral deposit that's formed on the face, like creating that color. And then the inside of that stone is the split face. So. 90 plus percent of the material that we quarry out is that split face, the inside of that stone. And that's going to be the least expensive option for a project. So if you have a project where uh, you're trying to meet budget and people select the, the weathered edge, the weathered edge is going to be the most expensive option because there's the fewest, there's the least of it in the quarry. There's only five to seven percent of that material in the quarry itself. There's 90 plus percent of that split face material. So if you're looking to decrease cost or meet a budget, just implementing a small amount of this, you know, five, ten percent into the mix will help reduce costs for the project if needed. And you'll still get the overall visual 
that you need. You're saying mix it with the weathered edge? You can. Yep. To reduce cost. If it's yeah. a budgetary concern, you know, only if it's a budgetary concern yeah. that you need to bring something down in cost. So there's different finishes that can be applied, typically for steps. You know, somewhere, somewhere where you've, uh, you need to make sure that you have traction. Uh, you don't want someone slipping or falling, especially like right now where, you know, it gets wet or, you know, icy. So typical, um, typical finishes that we see for like a step or a patio stone uh, that's finished is like a bush hammered finish or a thermal finish, a flame finish. Um, we'll also you know, do a brush where they take a metal brush and, and go over the top of the product just to create more traction. We don't typically want to do like a sanded smooth patio because of that. We need traction. So here's just a few of the finishes. Or doing a natural cleft. If you do a natural cleft like blue stone, uh, you get more traction. So there's a lot of options for finishes. And here's uh, like a thermal bluestone patio. Walking out to a little pond or something like that. But that just creates that extra traction and then a natural cloud. So even the visual will change slightly. When you thermal bluestone, it's going to change in color overall. You're going to get a more consistent color. When you use a natural cleft like this, it's going to be much more vibrant. I actually used the natural cleft in my backyard. <laughs> so, so getting into retaining walls, you know, building your, your retaining wall here, you want to make sure that you have the biggest pieces on the bottom. You're digging down six inches for that trench. Uh, we're looking for two inches of batter for every inch or foot of height. And then you're backfilling and compacting as you go. So step one, you have to determine the length and the height. You calculate the wall and the tonnage that you need. Get your tools. Some of the basic tools if you don't have a machine. You're going to be digging again 6 inches deep, 12 inches wide along the base. And you're going to put some of your biggest pieces, your biggest um, stone pieces in the base. So you're going to be filling that trench with compacted gravel or crushed stone as a base. Making sure that you don't uh, have issues with your freeze thaw cycle and the material heaving. Next, you're going to sort the stones by size, setting aside the most attractive pieces for the stones and the wall caps. You guys, you know, who, do we have landscapers here? A couple? All right. Do you guys see any issues with this wall? I picked that picture for a reason. No batter. Yeah, I don't see a lot of batter. What else? A lot of stacked behind. Yep. That's exactly it. So what we look for, if there's going to be an issue, we don't want to see vertical lines. You know, we want to see, you know, that you shouldn't see, you should see, you know, uh, broken joints here, you know. You should not see lines lining up throughout the entire project. So that's, uh, that's an issue. Looks like you've got a lot of small ones there in that spot. Yep, and you want to make sure you have your biggest ones on the bottom working up. Yeah. So, yeah, there's uh, the seams between the pieces should not align. And there's no batter. I don't see a lot of setback or batter. So one of the, one of the keys that we use um, as best practice is um, if you're using you know, a retaining wall stone like this, if you have a 12-inch deep, uh, the max height that we typically want to see is about 3 feet. So you go 3 times the, the height. Uh, as the depth. So 12 inches would be 36, 8 inches would be 24. Um, and if you have a taller wall, what we're going to look for is more batter setback, you know, to make sure that that stays in place. 
long term. Yep, so six, step six, placing the largest stones in the trench end to end. While stacking the wall, work from one end to the other, sloping the stone back towards the high ground. Avoiding continuous horizontal or vertical joints by breaking them up or using a larger and smaller stones. Um, yeah, this fella here is using mortar. He's got mortar spread here. He's actually bonding the material with mortar. Um, Hedberg sells a few different products for retaining wall stones. I talked to someone, I can't remember who it was. <laughs> I think Jeff a little bit. I talked to you a little bit about it. But just make sure I'm, I'm getting this right. Uh, SRW is a great resource, but they also sell uh, geo-grade woven geotextiles, reinforcement grid, non-woven boulder fabric for larger projects from SRW to be utilized to tie into the wall, into the ground, making sure that um, everything is in place and very sturdy. So if you guys want more information on the geo-grid uh, materials, yeah, see your headberg rep on that. We want to make sure that we place those stones tightly, minimizing joint size. You want to see nice tight joints. And then filling the area behind it with uh, dirt, gravel, and compacting it as you go. So every couple of courses you want to turn <coughs> the stone lengthwise into the hill. So if this uh, piece here was turned in, it's going to act as an anchor. Uh, to make sure it stays in place long term too. So here's a picture of a large scale retaining wall. That's our goldenrod product. So typically we're doing material with a 6 inch, 8 inch or 12 inch depth and then a 2 to 3, 3 to 5, 5 to 7 inch height range. So one of the products that, that Hedberg sells is a sawn height retaining wall product. So by sawing the material, instead of using a split, most installers are going to be able to reduce the time on the job by about 25%. So a little more expensive up front for the cost because of the sawing process, but you're reducing your labor time on the project. And it looks really sharp with a tight, tight fit. Do you recommend gluing them? Um, you, I've seen guys use PL four hundred. You know, I've seen it been, I've seen it used like that. Um, but I think so you want to use, yeah, make sure you're just using best practices, using your batter, going by what you're typically used to. You took the wall apart with that, you know. The, the mm -hmm. mentor block and well, that's, that stuff did a heck of a job. Yeah. Hammering that, taking Holding that apart, together. cleaning that up. Yeah. yeah. I've seen guys use PL400 on projects. So. so, coverage for a six inch, six inch deep wall stone will typically be 28 to 30 square feet per ton. Eight inch depth will be 18 to 20. And then a 12 inch depth will be 13 to 15 square feet per ton. So some of the typical. And then there's also a regular wall stone. So this is going to be more of your random shapes. But it will reduce your cost up front for materials. So there's a few different options to help reduce cost up front if you want to go that direction. So irregular material will be 9 to 18 in diameter, more irregular in shape. You're gonna get some triangle shapes, things like that, but it's graded by rise in a two to three, three to five, or five to seven. And it's uh, very helpful for curved walls if you're trying to do that. And there's some of the coverages. And I'm seeing a lot of this lately too, where they're pouring concrete and then using the masonry option to finish off the retaining wall. It's just mud, mud stone door? Yep. Does that stick good? Yeah, it does. So, 
typical uh, some other options for retaining walls. So boulders and outcroppings. Boulders we categorize as 12 inch and above in rise or height. Outcroppings uh, are five to seven in height. But your average uh, weight for a boulder, so if we're looking at, you know, you had talked about pushing boulders and manually, you know, moving materials. Um, average weight for a boulder that's 14 inch by 18 inch by 36 inch will be about 915 pounds for a Chilton or Fondalike boulder piece. Uh, 18 inch by 24 by 48, you're looking at over a ton. That's a lot of weight. Um, Correct. Yep. Uh, for Fond du Lac, it's about 170. Chilton is 177. So, yep. And then with outcroppings, yeah, six inch thick outcropping, three by three, be about 750. Eight inch thick, 1,000 pounds. Ten inch thick, 1,250. Uh, I'm sorry, 10 inch thick, and then 12 inch thick would be about 1,500 pounds. So some of these pieces can get very, very heavy. So just make sure you have the right equipment, especially when you're getting bigger pieces like this, to unload. Because if you don't have that readily available, that's going to take a lot of labor. So some outcropping projects. Mill Creek is another nice option. Very consistent in height. Typically right around that you know six to seven inch in height range. They stack very nicely. Here you got some outcroppings, outcropping steps going up on the Chilton and the Fond du Lac. We do see requests for outcropping signs. So we're taking a bigger piece of Fond du Lac, Chilton, Mill Creek, or whatever, um, making sure it fits the size range, and then blasting and uh, creating those signage pieces. But they look uh, very nice. I don't know if anyone. Oh, you're cutting it in there. So that is actually engraved. Oh. Yep. So we actually hire out an engraver to come in and engrave the material. On our on our board site, router or something, or what they use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's typical. There's certain machinery that they use to do that. But um, they create all different colors, different fonts. You know, you name it. You guys have a jig, don't you? Or yeah. You put some jig onto it. And it takes a little router yeah. or what? It takes some time. I mean, it's going to be. It's yeah. There's a lot of time that it's that's uh, usually about like a six week lead time to do that. It takes a lot of labor to do it, but it's a neat option. Uh, if anyone has been to uh, Chanhassen, you may have seen this piece. Uh, this is a piece out of our Fond du Lac quarry that was about 30 inches in depth, and 13 feet in height, and about 26 in length. So every now and then we'll find a piece like that, not very frequently. <laughs> how, how deep yeah. they got that in the ground? Did they set it in a concrete mud down in there? Or yeah, what? that was set in uh, very, yeah, they buried, I think, the first like eight inches of that boulder um, into the ground. Only eight inches? I think it was, and then it was, it was actually, there were rods that were drilled. Oh, sure. Yep. They had underneath it as well. Concrete foot. Yep, yep. So they had the everything rod. set right on, they had a crane really? that lifted it and dropped it right on to the rods. Really? Yep. For support. Yep. Yeah, so some different boulder projects. Typical residential boulder project. Uh, some commercial. This is in Omaha. So the wagon trail. And then getting into natural stone steps. A typical visual drawing of a, a step project. Uh, step one, determine the step size, select the product, gather the tools and materials, make sure you have the right fit. So
So what we're looking for in the right fit, making sure that you have um, the right product for the application, making sure that you know that your stone product is going to handle the Midwest climate, the freeze thaw cycles, um, making sure that you have uh, the proper absorption rate and density of the stone to make sure it's going to last and look good for a long time. Step two, lay out the steps, marking the area with spray paint and stakes. Dig the trench and set the first stone riser deeper. Step three, excavate the treads and risers, step at a time, setting and leveling the stones as you work up. Trim and shim under the unstable areas, protruding pieces as you need. Step four, make sure that you uh, use, you, know, you choose a plan with, if you choose a plan with, with cracks between the stones, fill in the material with sand and pea gravel to complete the project. So all this area filled in very nicely. So steps will typically range from 17 to 19 in depth and 23 to 25 in depth, depending on the coverage area selected. Five to eight inch height ranges are available. Uh, and then lengths are 24, 36, 48 inch in range, but can be customized. We've done, you know, 60 inch, 72 inch. Um, so there's different options they can use for projects and steps. Um, but what we're looking at too is the ASTM testing data, uh, the color range, geology. Again, it goes back to that absorption rate and then the density of the material. So this is a St. Mary's stone with, uh, we did a sandblasted texture on top and then rock face the front. So. Does it look like the, the rise is perfect mm -hmm. on each one? Is yeah, it? these are totally gauged, yeah. Right, so, so these are, already. they're sawn, the, the bottom was sawn, the top was um, finished. So each each piece was exactly the same height. You don't typically get that out of the quarry uh, where we have that natural cleft. So you're going to get some different changes in height. Um, that's why we range it range uh, from like 5 to 7. So on a 48 inch length piece of step, you may get some changes in height or undulation in the top layer. So I sent a bunch of granite last summer. It was what, 14, 13, 12 pieces, 12 different steps. And, and one of them, they were so close. Mm -hmm. One was only about uh, three eighths of an inch higher than the others. Mm. That's, that's, that's really good. Yeah, that makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Absolutely. So some of the different patio stones. Uh, what we look for for patio stone, having a nice flat, even area to work on. Work on. So what we supply are steppers and flagstone. Flagstone being large, flat, thin pieces of stone ranging from two to five inch, or two to five feet in uh, length and diameter and varying in thickness from three quarter to three inch. Um, steppers are eight to 18 inch and then vary from three quarter to three inch. So the one to two inch, you know, one, you know the, the thinner material you're going to get more square footage per ton, but the cost is usually a little higher. One to two inch will roughly be about 80 square feet per ton. And then um, anywhere from two inch to three inch, that thicker material, you're going to get roughly 60 square feet per ton. So how you build a, a patio or walkway? Step one, determine the coverage uh, needed. Select the product, gather the tools. Know what the site looks like. Are there problem areas? And will your equipment be sufficient? So is your patio stone consistent in size and height? Um, knowing that right up front is going to be critical. If you have something that's different in ranging in height, there's going to be a lot more labor typically to install it. Um, does your project have a slope? Are you um, sloping away from the home or, or building that you're putting that patio near? And can your equipment uh, get to the project area safely? So step two, mark the outline, establish the slight slope or pitch, and then start excavating. And you want to dig down at least six to eight inch below surface level. Um, fill with concrete or crushed gravel. 
Um, that's going to help with the Midwest freeze-thaw cycles that we have to deal with. And typically guys use four to six inch in depth uh, type two gravel for the base, uh, followed by one to two inch of fine pea gravel screenings or decomposed granite. And what do you guys use in installing a patio? Sand. Sand? Sand, Sand for the top. Okay. Top range. Okay. And then uh, we rake and level to get the grade you want. The only thing that, you know, I've talked to a few different landscapers. <laughs> The only reason we don't typically talk about sand is it holds in the moisture. You know, if you want it to run through and get out, yeah, sand will keep it there. So, sand can be used, um, and it's a good filler. But yeah, sometimes those screenings are a little uh, more forgiving. So, next is to lay the landscape fabric and spread the gravel, flatten the flattening compact with a jumping jack compactor or whatever you know brand you got and then level uh, to grade step four is to set the leveling pipes level and level the gravel spread and compact level the sand on top of the gravel that's screenings remember to slightly pitch away from the home or building and a patio should slope away from the house at a rate of one eighth of an inch or three millimeters per running foot. Eight feet in, in length equals one inch in slope. And this is recommended as, you know, commonly referred to as the one inch slope or one percent slope. So you're gonna set and level the stones, tamp the stones on top, top um, on the level down, on the high pieces, make sure it's nice and level. Um, Spread and sweep the polymeric sand. Do you guys use polymeric sand, or do you guys? What do you guys typically use? Polymeric sand. Yeah. So that's very common. That's what I did too. Uh, water to solidify the manu per manufacturer's directions. Uh, you want to try to minimize your cuts as much as possible. Use the biggest pieces on the outside first, because typically stone like Fond du Lac Chilton is extremely hard to cut and manipulate. <laughs> so it's going to take a lot of time and effort. Um, so. Typically we see guys using a four inch angle grinder, uh, working away those edges, and then breaking off with a sledgehammer. Um, so it looks more natural. Um, but check to level, make sure that the seams are even and flush. Stand on the pieces, make sure that there's no shifting or, or movement from the bottom pieces. Um, and then you may even need to fill areas and recheck as, po as needed. So just a few different patio projects and this whole project this is all Chilton stone here Chilton in the patio Chilton Chilton stone for the um, outcroppings the steps they don't show the house but the house is all done in Chilton building stone so the whole project was done with the same product out of the same quarry so but yeah doing something like this for a backyard patio if you have like a deck or something like that that's falling apart, it does truly give an upgrade in value. Um, just as a personal story, I recently sold my home. I put in a bluestone patio. Uh, one of the first things that they like keyed on was the outdoor patio and how nice it was. And they just envisioned their entertainment with friends. Um, so it adds a lot of value if you have that capability. Better than rotten. Yep. Cedar. Exactly. And then step six, yeah. Sit back and have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Some real walkway results. This is all natural bluestone here, bluestone steps, uh, bluestone irregular flag. Used all the way up to the, the doorway. So some really nice options that can be tied together, you know, with the, the siding, the, the gray siding, the white trim. The blue stone really pops with the, the light stone. I think they did a great job here. Good to find people that got money that want to do that. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And you guys are blessed. I mean, if uh, 
you know, you, uh, you live in a state with many, many thousands of lakes. <laughs> you know, anytime you have a lake area, you're typically looking at bigger projects. You know, where you have a walk path or steps down to a dock or um, a nice patio area like that. So some outdoor kitchen projects there. Uh, outdoor countertops, you know, making sure that um, you're sealing those if there's food grade, you know, food near it. There are food grade sealers. I know SRW does carry food grade sealer. So you definitely want to make sure that those countertops are sealed after, ins after, after installation. And then sealing frequency is done per the manufacturer's recommendations. Do they recommend like five to seven years resealing? Do you, anyone know? Yes, I would. At least, oh. yeah. So that's pretty typical. Yeah, again, this is an outdoor kitchen area for a, a company. Outdoor living. A few more outdoor living shots. And then one of the things that we see growing in this market particularly are the outdoor living, you know, uh, outdoor fire pits. Um, but what are people typically doing when they're sitting around a fire? Drinking beer. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, knowing that people are going to be drinking, um, make sure, you know, it's, it's, it's just best practice that you're not overloading that fire with heat. Um, because the more heat that's coming out, the more chance of this fracturing around this area is going to be. Yep, correct. A nice, nice little fireplace there. Dan, that's your house, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> some nice water features. Water feature, you know, the pool coping. Again, making sure that again you're around water, we're going to ask a lot of questions. Making sure that you have the right fit for the project. Some nice uh, lakefront properties there. And this one was taken uh, down near North Carolina. Oh. That is the presentation. You guys have time for a, a quick video on the whole coring process. You can see it from step A to Z on how we do everything on our end. Um, let me check and make sure. Let's see if this is. I don't know if I can hear that or not. At Ecostone, we live by our mission of providing the best, most dependable experience in the natural stone industry, guaranteed. And to start at the very beginning of the best, we're mindful of the fact that long before its beautiful showcase on the architectural projects of today, the lengthy lifespan of dimensional stone starts geologically with Mother Earth. Millions of years before Beagle Stone was even a thought, natural stone was being produced by Mother Nature. While working with the maker of this beautiful raw material, we're doing whatever she allows in order to provide our customers with only the highest quality dimensional stone. But as with anything precious, true worth is found beneath the surface. All of our natural stone products come from somewhere pure, authentic, and real. So we're proud to start your journey of our processes with an introduction to the place where it all began for us and our stone, our quarries. At Beagle Stone, we incorporate green thinking into everything that we do. That's why before a quarry is even proposed, we're protecting nature's design with quarry site plans that emphasize sustainability, resource efficiency, and long-term environmental advocacy. 
seismographic site plan is established. Operations can begin by removing any dirt or rock that overlies the stone. The topsoil and overburdened material is safe for placement into a berm, where it is covered, seeded, and stored until implementing the final reclamation plan. Once the stone is exposed, the material is removed from the quarry and benches. With the top bedding plane revealed, cracks and seams running along the surface of the stone are used as indicators of existing fractures through underlying layers. A large amount of stone used for building and landscaping is formed in layers. These layers were created over millions of years in sediment beds. The natural top or bottom of the stone is called the stone's bed face. This term comes from the natural bed or horizontal plane of the stone while forming. Natural cleft describes the natural thickness of the bed, which typically varies from layer to layer. There are two natural faces that can occur along the vertical planes of layered stone. A natural split occurs where the stone breaks in the quarry at a location where there isn't a natural seam. Weather edge, which is sometimes referred to as rustic, occurs where a natural vertical seam in the quarry has been eroded and minerals are deposited on the face. Variations in the depth and intensity of colors and textures are also signatures of each stone's unique creation story. These beautiful aesthetic distinctions allow us to combine stone faces in unlimited ways to create product blends unique to us and our quarries. And here's where the process of stone removal gets even more interesting. In preparation for a selective, sophisticated blast, drill holes are placed along the perimeter of the bench behind the natural seams. The distance between the holes depends on the variations and physical properties of the stone at the location of the intended break. Although we employ the use of high-grade explosives, typical blasting is not of Hollywood proportions. The drill holes are calculated to accommodate a light explosive charge, just enough to help separate the layers and loosen the stone for manageable removal with the use of heavy equipment. separate the stone. Stone slabs are extracted from the top down and then sorted and stacked on pallets according to general criteria such as size, thickness, and color. Material that is thinly layered is hand stacked on pallets. It's best for the pieces to remain as large as possible throughout the removal process so the stone can be used for its best potential. After all, we take significant pride and providing a full range of natural colors and textures that can be combined in infinite ways to achieve nearly any design, whether it be for building stone, cut stone, or landscape stone applications. Even with state-of-the-art production equipment, our technologically advanced specifying and design tools, the most detailed CAD shop drawings, and unparalleled <coughs> service, story of Beekle Stone's exceptional selection of natural stone starts with a quarry. There's uh, Chilton, Wisconsin. <laughs>